Lucy left an imprint on the American public that will never be forgotten. There's a, a greatness glow that seems to go along with uh, certain people. Lucy had it. You know, there really isn't a day that goes by that she doesn't dip into my, the cobwebs of my mind one way or the other. She was just a comedy genius. A uh, one of a kind, I think. Oh, no. They call me Sally Sweet. I'm the queen of Delancey Street. When I start to dance, everything goes chick, chicky, boom, chick, chicky, boom. Ay, 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 ay. Excuse me, Mr. Pete. Yes, ma'am. what has happened to this show. I guess it's going to go on forever. We're not, but it is. <laughs> if somewhere there is a book of days in which is written our future possibilities, then you can be sure at the very top of Lucille Ball's page are the words, Lucy Ricardo. All the other possibilities were no more than prelude to the creation of that one character we will never forget. Finding Lucy seems almost inevitable, and at the same time, the most unlikely of journeys. She arrived in Hollywood with the Depression and a million other hopefuls just like her, with a couple of significant differences. She had enough ambition to outshine a dozen future starlets, and she worked harder than any of them. For Lucille, there was no other choice. Like gladiators of glamour, they battled for recognition. And the ones who survived earned the right to be part of the fantasy factory. At 50 bucks a week. At the top of the food chain are the most dazzling creatures in the world. Movie stars. Those luminous entities who helped create the dreams that made the depression a little less depressing. Lucille offered herself up to the machinery of stardom, and they poured her into every mold. She was a willing piece of clay. I wish I could dance to it. Why not? They tried her as their romantic heroine. I've tried things. I've tried all for it. Dewberry was a lady, no matter what they may say. Dewberry they cast her as a musical a lady, comedy star. The gal of her day. If they couldn't find her type, it certainly wasn't from lack of trying. Lucille cycled through dozens of types, several hair colors, and four major studios searching for an identity. There are people who just appear on a screen and they just they just own the screen and you say who is that you want to know who this is i think with lucille ball it's no one saw lucy in her first few roles and said who is that maybe after about the 20th movie you'd think she looks familiar lucy she was great looking but she had a hard look about her and she said i always no matter how i get dressed up I always look like a cigarette girl at the Trocadero. Hello, handsome. What goes on under your hat? Mm, 
It was just telling me to find that gorgeous blonde. I always was a mind reader. <laughs> she used to always say it was like nails on a blackboard whenever she'd nice. enter someplace and Maureen O'Hara was there because she said, Maureen O'Hara is perfect. She is beautiful and she is perfect. And I'm not perfect. So who was Lucille Ball? Well, someone was asleep at the switch. Anyone with eyes in their head can see what Lucille is really good at. In the opening scene, she's doing this sort of shtick with the typewriter ribbon, and it's getting all over the place. And she had a wonderful ability to make us see what she was thinking. She's typing away. We know that the ribbon has come away from the keys, and she's, you know, sort of like going along and, and typing away anyway, as if she might be fooling somebody. She comes alive in those moments of silliness. She's engaged. She's real. The future Lucy Ricardo is slowly emerging like a photograph in a developing bath. But no one was paying any attention. Because regardless of her success in comic roles, the gospel according to Goldwyn was clear. Funny women don't sell tickets. Beautiful women do. But Lucille sold just enough tickets to become a major star in the minor leagues and earned the nickname Queen of the B Pictures. I was in a show called Too Many Girls. They so was Desi. And RKO bought the story for Lucille. George Abbott, who was our wonderful director, Mr. Abbott, uh, chose five of his favorites and put us all in a super chief to go to California to make the film. No, I'd never been out of New York. And on the way out on the train, they were all taking bets as to who Lucy was going to fall for. And everybody said, she's going to fall for Van. I said, no, we're too much alike. She's going to go for the opposite. Naturally, the rest is history. She went for Desi. You could see the fireworks and the, and the sparks. She fell in love with him and his accent and his dark, dark beauty. They were madly in love. There was no doubt about that. They couldn't keep their hands off each other. It was just... At 29, Lucille was five and a half years older and far more successful than Desi. Yet after a stormy six-month courtship, in 1940, they decided to marry. Against all odds and a good deal of advice. When I first met Lucy and Desi, they seemed like a couple of kids out in Chatsworth. They were having such laughs and fun, and they were together a lot. It was way out in the valley. Beautiful little one-story house with that old swimming hole type of swimming pool. And Lucy was a great hostess. And they did have some wonderful parties and all kinds of people. And not just big, well-known people, but a lot of unknowns. My first impression of Desi was a good impression. I felt that he was a man of substance, of character. He became part of our family real quick. Revolution forced young Desiderio Arnaz to flee Cuba. In America, he quickly styled himself as a Cuban Maurice Chevalier. He had flair, some talent, and a boatload of charm. From the moment they met, this woman he falls in love with is the star of the movie, and she was the star from then on. I used to see clippings that, in a scrapbook that they had at home, and it would talk about his band appearances, maybe at some club in Ohio, and it would say how great he was, but the sensational thing of the evening was that ringside was his wife, movie star Lucille Ball. 
I think on a deeper level, he appreciated that this was a woman who could take care of herself. His mother was a very dependent woman. And Lucy, who had never really gotten enough attention, found herself with this man who was jealous and passionate, and this made for lots and lots of excitement. And lots of trouble, too. He led his own band, crisscrossing the country in an endless stream of one-nighters, waking day after day to find he had been almost everywhere but home. She wanted to get him off the road because on the road, he was always slipping away from his marriage vows and was kind of out of her life. Her life was in Hollywood. Yet by 1948, Lucille's career had peaked without ever reaching the top of the mountain. She had appeared in 65 movies. As Lucy was entering her late 30s, I think she had to realize that she wasn't going to get the big lead glamour girl roles anymore. There were very few places to go at that age. Okay, let's try one more time. But there was one place. In radio, it didn't matter how old you were or how you looked. Radio was about voices. But for Lucille, radio was about destiny. She joined the little family that created a weekly program called My Favorite Husband. And at that moment, she stepped into the voice and shoes of a character who was only a heartbeat away from the one who would change broadcasting forever. We present My Favorite Husband, a new series based on the delightful stories of Isabel Scott Rorick's gay, sophisticated Mr. and Mrs. Cougar, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning. They're all there, George. I hung them up. Well, what did you do that for? I had them all neatly laid out on the floor where I could find them. <laughs> hello. Oh, hello, Ann. Lunch? How can you think of it? Aren't you going to the tryouts for the play? The Young Matrons League. It's in the paper this morning. On the society page, I just put it in front of, of George. My Lucy. favorite husband brought together the family that would go on to create I Love Lucy. Producer Jess Oppenheimer, writers Bob Carroll and Madeline Davis, and even some of the actors. I first met Lucy in radio. And at that time, they didn't have a laugh track. You know, they depended on a live audience to laugh. Lucy learned to play to the audience. Uh, she was used to doing movies. So it was kind of a new experience for her to, you know, to say the gag and then look out at the audience. She came alive before a live audience and developed the expressions that she used on I Love Lucy while doing her radio show. But radio was about to be eclipsed by the new kid on the block, television. From Hollywood. She jumped on it very early. She was one of the first guests on the Ed Wynn show. And she specifically sought it out because she was curious about this new medium. Television in those days was kind of the graveyard of failed movie stars. No one did television by choice. Lucy, this is wonderful. I love you, you know, in your radio shows every Friday night. You know, the ones called My Favorite Husband. I love him. I love him. I love him. I went to the sing, Babalu, but uh, wait, wait. <laughs> she asked me a lot about what it was like. I said, well, live television is death. It was such a high wire act. It's an aerialist with no net. It's wonderful, and people feel that. Desi, this is so silly what you're doing there. You'll ruin the whole show. It only, it only lasts a half hour. <laughs> Everything that we did was live. And I love that because if something goes wrong, your ability to correct it is part of the show. Lucille, you go ahead and get ready. And you, look at the way he's laughing now. He's laughing. He should buy a ticket. <laughs> on. They seemed happy, and they were, on the rare occasions that brought them together but they led separate lives. 
Lucille, I am sure all your fans are aware that in private life you're Mrs. Desi Arnaz, and I'd like to know this. With all the working you've both been doing, who catches up with whom and how? <laughs> it's practically topic A in our lives. We never write. I start to every now and then. I get halfway through a 14-page letter, and I get so lonesome, I just have to talk to him. <laughs> every now and then, I hear about you two looking for a Broadway play to do together. Oh, we're always looking. So far, no luck. It's easy to find things that separate us, but we're trying to find ways of staying together. One phone call changed everything. CBS approached Lucille with the idea of turning My Favorite Husband into a television show co-starring her radio husband, Richard Denning. And in response, Lucille took the greatest risk of her life. She said yes, but only if Desi were cast in the role of her television husband. I think the executives at CBS basically loathed Desi Arnaz. He was always referred to as the bongo player. And nobody even remembered his name uh, uh, at the beginning. And we kind of said, Desi who? <laughs> Doing Baba what? Well, brand new to us. Well, I'm afraid the network said, well, they said, well, you'll, they'll never believe you're married to a Cuban band leader. And, and Lucy said, well, I am married yeah, to a Cuban yeah. band leader. And she persevered. If CBS thought that Lucille Ball was going to cave in without a fight, they picked the wrong redhead. She and Desi decided to plead their case in public. We wrote a vaudeville sketch for them to see how they would be accepted they on the road. They took two different cities. New York, Frisco, Chicago, I think. And they appeared in the vaudeville show opposite each other, exactly as they later did on television. She was marvelous, of course. In it, we did the routine where Lucy plays a clown who plays a cello and tries to get into his act, which became the basis of the pilot that we did on television. Tell me something. Do you play that thing? How's that? I say, do you play that thing? What thing? <laughs> Never mind making fun of my English. That's English. <laughs> do you play? Do you play that instrument? Where? There. Where? Right there. Where? There. You brought it up here. Right there. There. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> do you play it? Well. <laughs> She, in essence, said, I don't want to do it without him. So if there's no Desi, then there's no me. And they needed her more than they didn't want Desi. Okay. Can you help me? I'll help you with it, too. Sure. You're welcome. It only took one week for the advertisers and the network to fall very much into line. It was not the Berlin Wall at all. They were, they were the masters of their own destiny immediately. The night I Love Lucy was on the air for the first time, we invited the cast to our house so we could all watch it together. We were all very quiet, except for Vivian's husband. And he was the only one that had never seen the script, never had heard much about it. And he just laughed so hard all the way through, just laugh, laugh, laugh. And we thought maybe, maybe we had a chance for a hit. What's the matter, you boy? No, it's not that I'm Come on, kiss me. Wait a minute, no. Come wait. on, kiss me. Please, no. Kiss me right now. Let's get a question. I was an executive at NBC, and we had all the top shows on the air. Desi and Lucy were the competition. I watched the show that night 
to be sure that we would retain our leadership. By 9.30 on a Monday night, uh, I knew my job was in jeopardy. I, uh, I must say, uh, Mr. Ricardo, I hope this being late isn't a habit with you. I like punctuality in the people who work for me. Oh, yes, sir. No, this was just an accident, sir. Well, I hope it was. She's so funny. You could hear that phrase uttered in America on Tuesday morning on commuter trains, up in ghetto areas, Park Avenue, it wouldn't make much difference. Everybody knew the next morning that the part of the conversation would be devoted to the show last night. They always referred to, did you see the show last night? You didn't say, did you see Desi and Lucy? You said, did you see the show? <laughs> Come here. Are you tired of paying high prices? Are you interested in a little high-class beef? Do you want a bargain? Tell you what I'm going to do. There's no doubt that Lucille Ball created a whole new audience for watching television. I got sirloin, tenderloin, T-bone, rump, pot roast, chuck roast, oxtail stump. And television, in turn, gave her that venue, gave her that format. Television was her medium, and really nothing else was. It took television, which required all her talents, her wonderful expressions, her physical gifts, to really bring her to flower. The movies she did uh, did not do that. That she didn't have that opportunity. They didn't give it to her, so she went out and got it. <laughs> <laughs> when Lucille finds Lucy, she discovers the character she has been waiting for all her life. After week, Lucille invents and refines. My Amida Amidjaman. <laughs> Remember that name. My Nevada Amidimat. Much to her delight and ours, she finds herself. I don't think there's anything up there, really. I don't. Well, they look like I saw something. <laughs> No one had ever seen anything like Lucille Ball on television or anywhere else. There was a lady that was a little crazy, and it was okay. Physical comedy goes across every border. People can laugh at that even if they don't understand what you're saying. The aliens will get a kick out of Lucy. We were very close socially, and that was when she called me. She says, how would you like to do one of the Lucys? Well, who would turn that down? Van Johnson episode, Lucy has told one of her New York friends that she knows all these stars, and it happens that Van Johnson is sleeping at the swimming pool at her hotel at the moment. So Lucy goes down and in a brilliant bit of physical comedy, mimes an entire conversation with the sleeping Van Johnson. And Lucy does this silent, you know, gesturing, eye-rolling, laughing routine. Who could escape those big baby blues? And that voice and that timing and those takes? Well, she wrote the book.
She was so true to that character that he just schemed right along with her. He wanted her to make it. She took you on some kind of a wild journey over those 22 minutes, and you couldn't wait to see what else she was going to cook up. You know, um, Carolyn, Van and I have gotten very chummy. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, he asked me to uh, rehearse with him this afternoon. What? What? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, Carolyn, if you promise to be very quiet, I could have Ethel sneak you in the back of the ballroom and you could watch the rehearsal. Oh, Lucy, you're a Lucy dog. Ricardo always had something up her sleeve where she oh, wanted to be a winner. And everybody in the world struggles. And Lucy was a struggler. You please, couldn't I just do a few steps with you? Oh, I'm sorry, that's out of the question. Oh, please, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be eternally grateful. I'll, I'll go see your next picture three times. I'll name my next child after you, if I have one. If I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll change the name of the one I already have. Even though it was off the wall, you were laughing and yet identifying. <laughs> You know, I loved when she finally got to dance with Van Johnson, and it was so beautiful. And you really saw that she really was unbelievably talented and incredibly gorgeous. And she goes into the dress room, and she like, she does this, and it's so real, and it's so honest, and it's so beautiful, and it, uh, I was, you know, a child watching it and wanting to be an actress and wanting to be Lucy and wanting to be a star and, you know, everything. I wanted to be married to a handsome husband like Ricky, but in that moment, it, you know, made me realize, you know, what a star she was. I loved her. I loved Lucille. When you think of the talent that's there and the talent that comes across when we start to roll the cameras, boy, she puts a strength in there that no one can touch. Lucy didn't like to see the script till the first reading. She wanted to see it fresh. We wrote everything out in the script, bit by bit, business by business. But this is not to say that she didn't add oh, yeah. incredibly. I think Lucy and the writers worked very well together. She accepted what they brought down, added to it. It was marvelous to watch how her head worked because she just always came up with something funnier. The foreman leaves Lucy, and Lucy sits down in front of the, another woman in, in front of the big, who's sitting in front of a big chocolate puddle. This is the room where they dip the chocolates. Lucy watches what the other woman is doing for a moment, then plunges in with all the vitality and glee of a child making mud pies. She plops her hands up and down and squishes the chocolate through her fingers. She picks up one of the cream centers. This should be a little fragile shell that looks like the other cream centers, but will crumble into nothing. She picks up some chocolate, rubs her hands, and can't find the cream center. It has disappeared. This time, Lucy's not taking any chances. She scoops three or four of the centers together, rolls them up into a big ball that she finally deposits on the tray and attempts to make a big flourish with the dripping. You give that script to somebody else, it ain't going to be that funny. It's the way she did it. It's the way she looked. It's the way she reacted. You can't write that. You can delegate it. You can say, okay, wouldn't this be funny if? But the if is a big thing. The if was if we had Lucille Ball. <laughs> Making it. I had to prance around in the back like this with her, and she was doing all that, so I made a dance out of it like this. Yeah. And finally, I slipped. And uh, in slipping, I hit her, and she took offense, and so she hauled off and let me have it. <laughs> now, this was, this was supposed to happen, and yeah. that she got right. 
Now, she had been told that we were to stay down for a while, give me a chance to get my legs way up mm -hmm. so that they'd show in the camera. Then up would come an arm, and then was supposed to, my head was supposed to pop. Well, my head never popped up. <laughs> she kept me down by the throat. <laughs> and I had grapes up my nose, in my ears, and she was choking me, and I'm really beating her to get her off. <laughs> but she was killing me. And somebody had to come in and say, look, let her up eventually. We had to get on with the scene. She said, oh, yeah, and down we went again. <laughs> Ow. Oh. Sometimes we would get an idea for a Lucy routine, and we'd say, well, how we get her there? Yeah, one night in Hollywood, Madeline or coming from someplace, Stop in front of a window at Michelli's Italian restaurant, and there was a man flinging the pizza up in the air. Did he get hair in or something? We said, hey, let's get loose. Oh. She went by, and it was in the window. <laughs> and of course, being her, she knew how to do it in about five minutes. Oh, yeah, just flying And so in the we air. said, now how are we going to do this? Lucy was a wonderful study. She loved to rehearse, and she would go over and over those physical routines. So they looked like they just happened. Madame, the leg down. Abba, 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 abba. She was marvelous, and a marvelous actress. And you couldn't do what she did without being a marvelous actress. She made ridiculous things seem almost possible. You know, some actors will say, well, I don't know if I want to get clay all over my face. Never. Or I don't know if I want to black out my teeth. She couldn't wait. She didn't mind looking funny, as long as she was funny. There just wasn't anybody on television doing this really broad comedy, and certainly nobody lovely looking. It was always the guys. And along came this woman, beautiful woman, who was just as funny as they were. It was the guys. Go all the way back to vaudeville. It was always the guys. Women were allowed to kick up their legs in scanty panty chorus lines. The few who escaped that bait did so as comic types the mostly male audience didn't find too threatening. You could be ugly, too fat, too thin, homely as a fence. Dumb was okay. You could regress to childhood or fulfill a male fantasy as an aggressive seductress with a razor-sharp wit. Goodness, what beautiful time. Goodness, I have nothing to do with it, dearie. There weren't a lot of female role models for someone like Lucille Ball. She had to look to the male comics. She loved Chaplin and saw in his character a sympathetic personality a bumbling underdog like Lucy Ricardo, one the audience always roots for. <laughs> and in Harpo Marx, she found the ideal inspiration for her own nearly perfect blend of schemer and clown. And then there was Buster. Buster Keaton was an old friend of hers, and he said, always know your props, which I'm sure he believed because he did a lot of dangerous things. Buster Keaton taught her to take comedy seriously. Ah! 
She wasn't a stunt person. She was just excellent with props. Keaton did teach her the importance of props and that her props were her tools. She really had to treat them as treasures. Anything wrong, Mrs. Ricardo? My nose itches. <laughs> Your skin soft. <laughs> I Love Lucy had vividness of character. It was four people. You knew them very well. And I was absolutely captivated by everything they did together. Oh! It was a magic combination where you got the perfect people for the perfect parts. What's the matter? Don't ask me, Fred. That Lucy's acting crazy. Crazy for Lucy or crazy for ordinary people? William Frawley was Fred Mertz. Fred Mertz was William Frawley. <laughs> the writers took from his life his irascibility. They took Bill Frawley verbatim. What do you want? You've got the boat? You wear pants? You know, Vivian didn't like being Bill's wife. She wanted to be more glamorous. She wanted him younger more appealing husband but the audience liked what they saw with them vivian was a perfect foil for lucy they played together beautifully <laughs> they had a real friendship and it made it so much funnier oh i thought we'd get stuck oh, this could only happen to you <laughs> they would get mad at each other over something good morning And then they would feel terrible and cry and make up. Hey, Lucy. Yeah, Ricky. You know, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the theater tonight. What? A tramp came up to me in the street and he said he hadn't had a bite in weeks. What'd you do, Biden? Bessie was a marvelous straight man, and he was very funny. Talk to the police. Policia, le habla señor Rick Ricardo. Mi señora está en un restaurante allá de la We're very happy that she married a man with an accent. Give us a lot of great stuff. There is something here that needs explaining. What needs explaining? What's all this? More than just her co-star, Desi Arnaz proved to be an innovative producer. We'd go down the set. Madeline would tell Desi the story for four weeks from now. He'd say, pretty good kids. Maybe the middle needs fixed. We said, okay, it needs fixed. And he was always right. Desi had a wonderful quality in that when you said to him, it can't be done, he'd say, why not? And then somebody would say, well, it's never been done. And he'd say, well, why not? Lucille would never have succeeded the way that she did without Desi. I have to admire him for having the knowledge of being able to put this thing together technically, financially, <laughs> emotionally, and make it work. And he's the guy that made it work. The bongo player turned out to be a television pioneer. Desi Arnaz led a formidable team, and week by week they invented from whole cloth the wheel of situation comedy. Performed like a play in front of a live audience with three cameras rolling, it was a format so successful it is still in use today. And if that wasn't enough, they also took us to a place where television had never gone before. At that time, situation comedy still had married people sleeping in twin beds with the lamp between them. You always had to believe that there was immaculate conception for any of the children. You could never use the word pregnant. You'd say expecting and... Uh, Heavy with child, maybe. <laughs> That's the way television was. That's the way TV was when in 1952, Lucille found herself pregnant with her second child. Common practice in Hollywood was to fire an actress if she got pregnant. At first, Lucille and Desi presumed they would have to walk away from the show. Well, the sponsors weren't too thrilled with this. 
And they said, well, maybe you can do a few shows or you can have her stand behind the chairs and not show she's pregnant. But uh, Lucy insisted on doing it. She wanted to do pregnancy stories, and she won that fight. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Listen to this. Dear Mr. Ricardo, my husband and I are going to have a blessed event. I just found out about it today, and I haven't told him yet. I heard you sing a number called We're Having a Baby, My Baby and Me. If you will sing it for us now, it will be my way of breaking the news to him. Isn't that wonderful? Of course I'll do it for you, sure. Uh, my... Oh, wait a minute. I got a wonderful idea. Why don't we bring the couple up here and I'll sing it right to them, eh? Come on, let's bring them up on the floor. Come on, folks. Come on, we just want to wish you luck. Who is it? Rock a my baby on the tree top. No. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. No. When the bow breaks, the cradle will rock. Lucille Ball was the first pregnant woman to be broadcast into people's homes. It was a brilliant thing. People felt like they were participating in the creation of this family life. And they were. Hiya, honey, on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will fall. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. Uh honey, honey. <laughs> Honey, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? Why, you didn't give me a chance. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> it's <don't>... me! <laughs> I'm gonna be a father! I'm a father! I want you to be my mother! I mean, my wife, my wife! <laughs> what? <laughs> We're having a baby. My baby and me. The audience was in tears. It was terribly emotional. It really was. I get a little, you know, weepy just thinking about it because it's, that show really pulled on the heartstrings and it struck a chord of humanness and true love. We're having a baby. Sometimes we quarrel, but then <laughs> how we love making up again. I really think that one of the contributing things to the show was that Lucy and Desi really loved each other, and I think you can see that in the show. Lucy wasn't the only one who loved Lucy. America was head over heels. At 42, Lucille Ball was ready to have her baby, and the whole country was watching. for when you get the signal, everything should go like clockwork. I don't want to lose a minute getting you to the hospital. Oh, that's a wonderful right. idea, Ricky. Now, Ricky, yeah. Ricky, Ricky. I was in a show called Wonderful Town, and we had a television set in the back for when Lucy had the baby. And the entire evening, everybody was running back. Is it there? Is it? We were all so involved in this. I felt as though we were all part of it. Another maternity case coming in. More people watched the birth episode than had watched any single television program. 
Lucille Ball had her baby the same day the birth episode aired. The next day, Dwight D. Eisenhower was inaugurated. But on January 20th, 1953, Lucy's baby was the top story of the day. The country likes Ike, but they love Lucy. When he was born and it was announced, they got warehouses full of presents. She had never felt that feedback from people before in her whole career. And she'd worked very long by this point and worked very hard. I think she always thought she might be appreciated, but I don't think Lucy ever thought that everybody would love her. They loved her because they identified with her. So while the Ricardos and the Arnezes were having babies, the rest of the country was energetically engaged in the same activity. The baby boom was on. The Ricardos and the 50s were a good fit. Just as international travel was becoming affordable to the middle class, the Ricardos and the Mertzes head for Paris. They were doing what we were doing, but their disasters seemed like a lot more fun than the rest of ours. The avalanche of consumerism that followed World War II echoed in the I Love Lucy scripts. It won't cost us a cent, Ricky. Look, it says right here, this freezer pays for itself. Oh, well, let me see. Hey, maybe we ought to get one. Really? Sure. As soon as he gets through paying for himself, tell it to give us a call and come over. They bought, we bought. They sold, we bought some more. You could model your life after the Ricardos. You could dress like them, smoke their brand, even remodel your house like theirs. By the time the Ricardos moved to the suburbs, the great suburban migration was well underway. But Lucy Ricardo was not exactly your typical suburban housewife. She was by no means a June Cleaver because she was not happy sending him out to work with a paper bag filled with lunch that she prepared and tidy up the house and make it all ready for him when he gets home. That wasn't what she was about. The minute he left, she started scheming with Ethel how she can get her way and do what she wanted to do. I think Lucy Ricardo was less a feminist than an argument for why women needed feminists. Introducing Petunia Ricardo. What she had was just an insane desire to be noticed. <laughs> Lucy demonstrated how much energy, how much ambition was being wasted by the early 50s ethos that women should be in the kitchen. Well, you'll do for the comic, but who am I going to get for the ballet dancer? Oh, Ricky, you're mean. Look, honey, you're not serious about this, are you? I am, too. Here I am with all this talent bottled up inside of me, and you're always sitting on the cork. <laughs> now, Lucy? I'm going to get in that show if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> Lucy wanted to be in show business more than anything. She just worked her way in every time. I mean, it drove him insane, but there was no stopping her. What's the matter? Nothing, I'm fine. <laughs> Lucy Ricardo yearned for a life in show business and was spectacularly unsuccessful. But Lucille Ball, well now, that's a redhead of a completely different color, and the color was money. By 1953, I Love Lucy was the highest rated show on television. On the air two years, it won two Emmys. The sponsor and the network expressed their gratitude by renewing the show for an unprecedented $8 million. 
Lucille even made the cover of Time magazine. When their peers honored them on an Ed Sullivan special, the entire country witnessed their gratitude. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I think if it wouldn't have been for Lucy, I would have stopped trying a long time ago because we came to this country and we didn't have a cent in our pockets. From cleaning canary cages to this night here in New York, it's a long ways. And I don't think there's any other country in the world that could give you that opportunity. I want to say thank you. Thank you, America. Thank you. But America in the 1950s had a less generous side. I can remember opening the paper and reading the headline that said, Lucille Ball is a communist. I'm surprised that not one person stood up and said, hold it, Lucille Ball's going to attack us? Come on. I would not employ any proven or admitted communist because they're just... The entertainment industry was an easy target for McCarthy's red baiters. Fear and paranoia swept through Hollywood and Lucille was caught up in the wave of accusations. Grandpa was very involved with the workers, and he wanted us to register communists. We want to accommodate Grandpa, so we did. We went down and registered communists, period. Well, the week that mentioned that Lucy was a member of the Communist Party was quite a shock to everybody. Like, uh oh, here it goes. The show's all finished. Yeah, we thought the show might yeah, be, be all finished over. because people's careers were ruined in those days oh, yeah. by things like this. She was on the brink of losing everything, just like that. Lucille Ball had to go out, this accused communist, before people. Dangerous thing was what would happen with an audience. We really didn't know. We had no way of knowing. We had this commotion going on. There were plainclothes men standing around in the audience. She was scared to death. Desi Arnaz tried to find out if CBS was going to support them, and he couldn't get anybody to answer. It was kind of tense, and uh, that night at the show, Desi came out and told everybody what had happened and hoped that everybody would stick with them. He said, you all know about Lucy being called a communist. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you all been reading the papers today, but up till now, you only read what other people have said about Lucy. Lucy has never been a communist, not now and never will be. I was kicked out of Cuba because of communism. We despise everything about it. And now I want you to meet my favorite wife, my favorite redhead. In fact, that's the only thing read about her, and even that's not legitimate. Lucille Ball. And then she comes out. Da 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 dun dun dun. You know, and here she comes through that curtain and she runs one end of the stage and bows and she runs the other way and bows. They can't get enough of her. Finally, I can relax. Lucille survived the storm that swamped a lot of smaller boats. She continued to dominate the television landscape and Hollywood lined up to be part of her parade. It's just that something happens to her when she gets close to a movie star. <laughs> Fire hole at the Brown Derby. Yeah, that's the one I heard. True. And also the thing about she sneaking to Cornell Wild. Yeah, I heard about it. That's true. <laughs> As a matter of fact, she wanted to join us in our luncheon today. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, don't worry about it. She's not within 10 miles of here. All right, Cap, I'll take it from here. <laughs> Richard Widmark was just one of the major stars who did a turn on I Love Lucy. Lucille's dance card also included Rock Hudson. Aren't you Mrs. Ricky Ricardo? Charles Boyer. <laughs> John Wayne. Even Superman flew in for an appearance. Tell me, when you're flying around, do you have Kate trouble? No, but then I've had a lot more flying 
Valentine than you had. Oh. Lucy, what are you doing out there? Oh. that you've done in the 15 years that we've been Wait married. Yes, that's really... Sergeant, do you mean to say that you've been married to her for 15 years? Yeah, 15 years. Then they call me Superman. <laughs> 15 years was a long time for the Ricardos and for the Arnezes. But when your marriage is a public institution, keeping up appearances goes with the territory. The public really believed that they knew them and knew their personal life. Desilu had an amazing publicity machine. They were able to convey a very strong sense of what the Arnez Ball marriage was like in quote unquote real life. Lucille and Desi encouraged that familiarity, the idea that their real marriage was as happy as their TV marriage. But it wasn't. Lucille continued to hope that working together could save their marriage, but maybe it wasn't a realistic hope. Being a, a happily married couple in, in television and then being unhappily married at home was a strange paradox. It, 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 it helped to go to work, if you know what I mean. It helped every morning to have to get up and go to work. Once we were on the set, it was a happy marriage. Lucille Ball, I think, always idealized the wife. I think the, the wife with a capital W was something that was very meaningful to her in fantasy, but that she never really tried to be in reality. She loved her family, but I'm not sure Lucy was ever that honest to herself about, about where family fit in. I think she dreamed that she and Desi Arnaz would have a simple little domestic life and she would cook and take care of the babies. But, th but then all of her actions proved that her real desire, the real burning desire in her was for something very different. She was born with a drive, a, uh, a mental attitude to move forward, to succeed. I think it comes from uh, the genes, uh, her father, her mother, her grandfather. She adored her father, a tall, handsome man who bequeathed her his sense of humor before surrendering to typhoid fever. He had little else to give, and the family was left poor and broken. Little Lucille was three. Shuffled from relative to relative, it was a childhood torn asunder. Grandpa brought us up. And we all worked, all of the time. And then we had chickens and uh, pigeons and uh, pigs and, you know, Lucy kept track of the house and all the cleaning and the, some of the cooking and so forth. Bossy she was, in charge <laughs> she was. But I accepted that. Lucille was compelled to take charge. Her mother was constantly pulled away from the family in Jamestown, New York, in order to support them. We never called her mother or her mom. She was dating. The bond between mother and daughter was unusual and unusually strong. More like sisters, they remained close their entire lives. Dee Dee didn't have total control over Lucille. Dee Dee did have confidence in Lucille's ambition. It was faith well-placed, and Lucille rewarded Dee Dee's confidence. As soon as she got her foot in the Hollywood door, she sent for the whole clan. There on North Ogden Drive, she reunited the fractured family of her childhood. It was a pattern she repeated again and again. Lucille and Desi were determined to run Desi Lou as a family business, even when the family was more than 800 strong.
Desi Loop picnics, people did have a good time. You'd bring your kids and they'd have lots of food and they'd have games and you'd have three-legged races and all that kind of stuff. Little Desi and Little Lucy grew up as part of that larger family. Loyalty came easily to Desi and Lucille and generosity too. Everybody was involved. Everybody was included. It was come in and join the family. That's the way Lucille felt. That's the way she talked. That's the way Desi felt and talked. Family. You know, we're all family. I move that we dedicate the next number to our wonderful friendship. That's I subscribe right. to their friendship. 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 Here we go. Ah, now they have all right. Ready, go. Switch It's no surprise that their television show radiated that same sense of family, a sense that friendships have value. We watched those relationships deepen, and in the alchemy that is television, they became part of our family too. But what flowed so effortlessly into our living rooms was actually the result of a lot of effort. The pleasure they gave us was for them an exhausting struggle. From the little radio family that created My Favorite Husband, they had grown into a factory that employed hundreds of people, shot miles of film, and produced dozens of other TV shows. I think they were happier before they became stars. I think that grind got to them, and Desi had uh, a problem. Desi's uh, extracurricular activities in a small town like Hollywood or Beverly Hills weren't the best kept secret in the world. He was a notorious womanizer, and he was a pretty good drinker. And he brought a great shadow uh, over her life and depressed her a great deal. The Lucy Desi Comedy Hour. On March 2nd, 1960, the I Love Lucy creative family gathered for the last time. The show featured Ernie Kovacs and his wife, the popular singer Edie Adams, who was asked to bring a song. I remember choosing the song very carefully. It was a very favorite of Ernie's and mine. I didn't think anything of it at the time. But then when we went in to rehearse, it was obvious that things were not all well with Desi and Lucy. They weren't speaking, just weren't speaking to each other. Desi would say, would you tell Miss Ball to stand over by the... And she'd say, would you tell Mr. Arnaz that I can't stand... And, oh, I thought, uh-oh, we're in for a bumpy ride. Everybody wanted to just get through it, get it done, get it in the can. It was a big cloud over the whole set, and everybody was on edge. When I sang the song, it was, I can only give you love that lasts forever. And the promise of a dream I can't recall. And a love whose burning light will shine the winter's night. That's all, that's all. I can only give you country I walks in springtime. I can give you country walks in springtime. And a hand to hold when leaves begin to fall. And a love whose burning light will warm. That's all. It's a poem, a poem to love. And in my nearsighted eyes, I thought everybody was crying. And I thought, oh my, what have I done? I picked this song, and everybody is crying. Everybody. I just inadvertently picked maybe the most uh, inappropriate song for that day. Say it's me that you adore. For now and evermore That's all, that's all I love you Yes, I love you That's all 
We knew for a long time it wasn't going to work. And uh, it's our family. You know, our family. We were a family. We went on picnics together and wonderful things, you know. And uh, we just couldn't believe that they were so strong together as lovers and, and that they would allow it to happen to all of us. I don't believe I heard until the very next day that she had indeed filed for divorce and absolutely going through with it. It was the end of um, an era in television that I don't think we'll see again. It lasted nearly 20 years, Lucille Ball's marriage to Desi Arnaz. And when it was over, Lucille once again revealed her survival skills. She carried on alone. She was not the kind of a person to ever say, this is the end, I'm satisfied and I've done it all and there's nothing more to be accomplished. She was not any person that would ever give up, never. She came back. And hard work, as always, was a cure for practically everything. I think she wanted to come back because she loved the work. When CBS learned that Lucy wanted to return, there was no joy and screaming and hollering that we've got her back, we've got our Lucy back. You really say to yourself, Not, it won't work this time. If you're Lucille Ball, a little network skepticism is a minor deterrent. Steamrolling over all objections, she got her new show on the air. I never heard of glue like this. Ugh. Now, come on, Lucy. Yeah, come okay. on, get me around. This is, come on, get me around. Okay. Oh, get a glue come on, glue. get a good grip and go. <laughs> I played Harry Connors, her friend next door. So I would open each sequence and close it. You know, I would say, now, I've got to go to Pittsburgh. Don't get in any trouble. <laughs> and I'd leave. Then she and Viv, of course, of course would uh, uh, get stuck to the wall. And uh, I would come back at, in the last act hey, the and uh, say, uh, that's another fine mess. <laughs> My character didn't continue because they didn't need me anymore. They found their nugget that they needed with the two of them. Lucille Ball was wise to keep Vivian Vance around. In some ways, that relationship gets almost deeper in the second show with the absence of Ricky and Fred. Yeah. How can you even talk about a drink of water after all we swallowed in that shower? Well, I can't help it. Apparently, drinking water makes me thirsty. <laughs> Do you really see a years-long female friendship, a real mutual understanding that you almost never see on TV? Lucy, I want to tell you something. This is absolutely the last time I slip into my coveralls to be an apprentice on one of your dreadful little projects. But it wasn't the last time, or even the second to the last time. Before Vivian took her last bow with Lucy,
they completed a circle of friendship that stretched over 25 years and almost 300 television shows. Was the Lucy show as good as the Desi Lucy show? No. But within just a few weeks, the ratings were so high, she proved us all wrong. She proved she was the superstar. And she picked up exactly where she left off at 8.30 Monday night in a way that dumbfounded us all. She always called me kid because she was 22 years older. So I was kid. And she said, you know, kid, I used to come in and just do Lucy and I'd be, everything would be perfect. I didn't have to do anything but be Lucy. And she said, and then we separated and I had to go in on a Monday and I looked at the script and it wasn't right. She said, and I realized I had to be strong and be what Desi was or I would sink. Well, we never, we've not always had the problem of not being able to, to run our cameras in closer. <laughs> but what, which causes the shadows? She wanted total control over every single thing that was done from the mic man, the boom man, the lights, every writing thing, who did the hair. Excuse me, I just saw something. What camera is he working in now? With that. Over here. That's what I thought. Over there. And that ain't right. She definitely was tough. Um, but I mean that in the good sense of the word. Two and a half years after their divorce, Lucille bought Desi's shares of their company. At 51, she presided over Desi Lou's 35 sound stages, 50 acres of land, hundreds of offices, and 1,700 employees. I would like to welcome each of you to this annual meeting of stockholders, and I hope that your visit with us today will be both informative and enjoyable. I when you no think of the, the help of this is Lucy Ricardo, I mean, you, you visualize the same actress who presents herself as such a goofball, is running this giant company. Lucille Ball was the first female head of a studio. And I will tell you, she made two very brave decisions. One was Mission Impossible, and the other was Star Trek. Lucy said, all right, go ahead and make them. Lou became one of the best business persons in town. She ran that place, and she ran it with an iron fist. And I guess you have to be a little crusty. A lot of people were taken aback because she was a woman. She opened those doors for women to be accepted as executives. You know, Lucy did it, so why couldn't I? You have this image of being a, a, a strong-minded businesswoman, as you That's probably know. It's just an image. Head of a corporation. And I, I picture you sitting at the head of a table saying, uh, you're not pulling your weight, fatso, out of here. And, uh, I, I do like a lot of think, crying before I do I that. I like to think of you that way for some oh, reason. Oh, you that, do not. That contrast between No, you, you do not. No, I'm not like that at all. If I, whenever I've had to fire someone, I have many sleepless nights, and I, and I have, have many times cried. <clears throat> Lucy Sometimes. was not comfortable being perceived as a woman no. with real power. If she was interviewed as the president of Desilu, she would dust the tables while she was being interviewed to show that she was a real gal, too. I don't think Lucy ever wanted that kind of responsibility. She didn't like to get up in the morning and have to worry about a stockholders meeting that she was going to have to talk to at lunch. She could do it, but that's not what she wanted to do. She wanted to be performing. And perform she did taking her Lucy character for yet another spin. I want you to meet the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of Here's Lucy, Miss Lucy of all. Lucy and Alex, come on. She married Gary Morton and once again established a family business. 
Now Gary does the warm-ups, and she cast her real children as her TV co-stars. We have a lot of good friends in the audience tonight, and we have a real big show for you. So let's get on with it, huh? Okay? Okay, doll. I almost hate to say it, but I think what's missing from Here's Lucy was Ricky. Here's Lucy. Without having a co-combatant, each show seemed to become just a pretext for comedy bits. You know, I'll tell you what burns me up the most, being replaced by a computer, a machine. But there's one consolation. People have one advantage over computers. We think. We know what we're doing. No <laughs> the comedy bits were very well done. She continued to have her timing and her ability to do slapstick for a long time. She still could be funny, but she simply didn't have the focal point, the thing that gives the stories real suspense. Lucy, at that point, was totally into work for work's sake and not for creating something wonderful. She was going by rote. The scripts were bad, and no enthusiasm to do it. I think in the end, Lucy just gave up, too. I saw her a lot on television, and I thought, oh, she's, she's changed. At the age of 75, Lucille starred in a fourth attempt to revive her beloved character. She was canceled after eight episodes. On the final series, she was a grandmother, but she still had to behave the way she had when she was Lucy in the first year. And it just didn't go. We had a party for the cast after the last show. It was in a house that had no furniture in it, and Lucy was a little late. She was very serious, just kept wandering around the various rooms and looked so sad. <laughs> I just thought it was an omen of what was coming or what had come, which was the end of her career. The same year her career ended, Desi died. Lucille spoke with him on what would have been their 46th wedding anniversary. Two days later, he was gone. As I look back, I do not believe that Desi ever really left her life. There was such a bond between them, it would never be broken. TV Guide says the face of Lucille Ball has been seen by more people than the face of any human being who ever lived. She reigned as the first lady of television for 35 years. All she wanted to do was work as an actress. And all the public would ever buy her in was Lucy. And then it came that they wouldn't buy her as Lucy. And then that was the tragedy of her life. I remember seeing her at some charity event. And she came on and she said, My name is Lucille Ball. And everybody applauded. And she said, I used to be on television. She didn't have a good, happy ending, really, I don't think. I don't think so. She never missed sending me flowers on my birthday. And um, she was in the hospital that week, and everybody was expecting her to be released. I got up the next morning and I turned on the morning news and there it was. She died on my birthday. And that afternoon, her flowers arrived for me. My funny valentine Sweet comic valentine You make me smile with my heart Your looks are laughable 
unphotographable Yet you're my favorite work of art Is your figure less than Greek? Is your mouth a little weak? When you open it to speak Are you smart? If you care for me Stay little Valentine Stay Each day is Valentine's Day Lucille's journey was her valentine to us. Most of us thanked her with our laughter. Diane Sawyer thanked Lucy with these words. I can't remember a thing about my real life compared to what I remember about the Ricardos. Lucy, I'm home. Oh, hi, honey. I can remember where every stick of furniture was in their apartment. How come we always get sucked into Lucy's wild schemes? Because we're a couple of schnooks, that's why. It may be that during business hours, God and the angels sit around watching six-hour documentaries. But in the back family room, they're watching I Love Lucy. You know something, Lucy? What? Being married to you is not easy. No. But it sure is a lot of fun. I believe there's laughter in heaven because Lucille Ball is there.